So we can see, well, what do people actually do? And is that behavior prevalent enough to deserve putting a name on it? The answer to the latter question is yes. So we have something called the disposition effect. And the disposition effect is exactly this tendency to hold what we feel personally are loser stocks, meaning based on their past behavior. And to be more willing to sell what we personally consider to be winning stocks based on their past behavior. And what this means, if we're seeing this systematic effect, and this, this effect is pretty pervasive, or at least used to be before there was a lot of research about the disposition effect. And we'll come back and talk about that a little bit. That this behavior indicates to us that people are making choices based on their past experience with the item rather than making choices that are purely forward-looking as would be rational. And we're also seeing not only that people seem to be making decisions based on past performance rather than expected future performance, but that people are specifically behaving in accordance with this idea of loss aversion. That I've even heard it in various ways from you all when explaining what you would do. You were talking about you know, realizing losses versus realizing gains. And there seems to be some general feeling that as long as a loss is just on paper, it doesn't count yet. And as long as a gain is just on paper, it doesn't count yet. So if I bought a stock at 100, it went up to 120. I don't, in a you know, mental accounting sense, fully internalize that gain until I've sold the stock and in some way felt like I pocketed that difference. Similarly, psychologically, it seems like, say we again bought the stock at 100, it goes down to 80. We don't feel like we're fully internalizing that loss or feeling the pain of that loss until we close out that account, sell the stock, and you know, are forced to mentally match up what we bought it at and what we sold it at. Even though that you know, opening and closing of those mental accounts isn't A, necessarily optimal, but B, isn't what matters in terms of maximizing future return. Because regardless of how bad something was in the past, the fact is you hold it today. Do you want to keep holding it? Depends on what you expect it to do in the future. But we see people behaving in this loss-averse way where they're biased against realizing losses in favor of realizing gains instead, even when that's not profit maximizing. Hmm? So <clears throat> how does this relate to selling winners early, is it that we're scared that it might go down again? The stock price might go down in the future? Or? Well, the, the motivating example that I gave is that you are not selling in anticipation of any event, but you are selling for the purpose of liquidity. Like I said, you wanted to buy a car. And so we were working with the constraint that you've got to sell something. What do you want to sell? So I was giving you a little bit of a contrived scenario, scenario there more generally, and this is something that we have to distinguish, that what you seem to be talking about, and this is what we're getting to right here, they say, well, wait a minute. You're telling me that, you know, then the, a couple of you actually seem confused by this. That you're like, well, wait, you seem to be implying that looking at your portfolio, selling off those stocks that you feel are winners, that you feel have gained in value since you've gotten them, and hold on to the stocks that have lost in value. Some of you seem a little bit confused that this is not an optimal strategy. I'm going to tell you, and we'll show you specific evidence, no, this is actually not an optimal strategy. That there are one of two assumptions happening that would lead people to believe that this might be an optimal strategy. And both of them centered around this notion that today's winners are tomorrow's losers and vice versa. And they're, they have names. The first one is a false belief in mean reversion. So you think about mean reversion generally, what that means is if you have 
an observation that's very high or very low, meaning very far above the mean, very far below the mean. If you have a process that's truly mean reverting, that next observation is likely to be closer to the mean than the one that you just saw. So you have, for example, there was an interesting snippet that I read one time about airline pilots where they would get praised after an exceptionally good landing. They would get talked to after an exceptionally bad la landing. And if you looked at the data, it looked like the incentives were very perverse that it seemed like giving positive feedback caused the pilot to do worse the next time and yelling at the pilot caused the pilot to do better the next time. But that wasn't what was actually happening. That if you have an unusually good landing, what you're actually seeing is the pilot's landings are probably a bunch of independent observations centered around some mean. So if they have one that's really good, well, yeah, the next one's likely to be worse than that. Similarly, if they have one that's really bad, the next one's probably going to be less bad. That just that natural process exhibits some mean reverting behavior. But not every process has that mean reverting behavior. That in this stock market, there are a lot of time periods, there are a lot of examples where we cannot assume this form of mean reverting behavior. And if we're making a heuristic or we're forming a heuristic for ourselves that we want to sell the winners because they're going to be tomorrow's losers or vice versa, we're believing in some false or mostly false in this market notion of mean reversion. You could even take that a little bit more extreme and talk about what's known as the gambler's fallacy. Have you guys ever heard of that? So, eh, what do you well, talk to me? Okay, so like say you're going to that table. Yeah, or the, or the idiot that you stand behind in, or sit behind in Fenway Park that's like, you're seeing the batter that it's in a slump, and they're like, he's totally going to hit a home run now because he's totally due. And you're like, yeah, that's not how that works. <laughs> but it's this, yeah, it's this false notion of even when you have something that are independent events, you know, the roulette table is probably a better example because there probably is some correlation across time of a batter's performance. That the gambler's fallacy is that there's some sort of negative autocorrelation that's not actually there. Meaning that, continuing the, the roulette table example, if you hit red and you ask the person subject to the gambler's fallacy, okay, what do you want to put your money on the next time? They'll be like, black, because I just had red, so it's not going to happen again. And you're like, well, wait, that's not how this works. That's not how any of this works. <coughs> but people do that. And especially when they start seeing strings, like you were pointing out, that they would say, oh, I just got nine reds in a row. What is the chance that I get a tenth red? The problem there is not understanding the idea of conditional probabilities. That while it is true that it's unlikely in an unconditional sense to get ten reds in a row, it's about one in a thousand, the probability that you're going to get a tenth red conditional on you already having gotten nine reds is slightly less than one half. Right. And it's only not exactly equal to one half because there are the two green spaces on the roulette board, right? So I was just being overly picky there, right? And those two green spaces are actually why the roulette table is in the house's advantage. Because this they all pay out thirty six to one but there are 38 squares. Fun fact. But yeah, that gambler's fallacy, that guy will be like, oh, well, you know, these guys, this stock went up, went up, went up. It's due to go down. I'm totally selling it. Right. Mm -hmm. So what's the best strategy? The best strategy would be to not try. I'm one of those economists telling you to put your money in an index fund, right? Um, but what we'll, what we'll see is that in a lot of cases over a, lo a, lo a lot of time horizons, it is not a profitable strategy. And we'll show with this specific data set that believing in mean reversion and acting accordingly would not be profitable with the data set that we're going to look at. So we can see specifically these people are behaving suboptimally. But the proper best thing to do 
would be to think about that future projection and make sure that whatever future projections you're looking at are not subject to these cognitive fallacies, right? That if you're seeing future projections based on, you know, actual fundamentals or anything like that, I would put a lot more weight on that than something that said, eh, this is bound to rebound, you know, this is, obviously it's going to rebound because that's how things work and you're like, no, that's not how things work. So the more you have actual information baked into your future pro projections, paying a lot more attention to that than future projections based on past returns is going to be helpful. So you see what I'm saying? Isn't there a difference if you invest long term and short term? So like, wouldn't this be more applicable to long term, whereas in short term you can, you don't really know, but like, big bursts, and then the mean reversion would only really happen maybe one year or two years span or something. Well, what we're going to show with this data set actually is that even over a several year time horizon, there's no substantial mean reversion to speak of. Oh, there's not. Yeah, but in general, you're exactly right that the time horizon matters because it's entirely possible for something to exhibit mean reverting behavior in the short term but not the long term or vice versa. And in this case, we're looking at individual retail investors. We can infer to some degree, they weren't day traders, that they're investing with a reasonably long-term perspective so we can look at one-year returns, two-year returns, things like that that are likely more appropriate than looking at like five-day returns. So the, the returns looked at in this paper are consistent with what likely are the time horizons of the people making these choices.